You are listening to Down Home. In this episode, me and Jay will be taking a look at the Netflix film Rustin, starring the talented Coleman Domingo and directed by George C. Wolfe, with a screenplay by Julian Rees and Dustin Lance Black. Be aware there are spoilers in this episode. If you haven't watched the Netflix movie Rustin yet, proceed with caution. We'll be talking about its most pivotal moments. Have you heard of Bayard Rustin? If not, you're not alone. Despite his monumental impact on American history, Rustin's name often remains in the shadows of the civil rights movement. In this episode, we talk about aspects of the remarkable life and legacy of Bayard Rustin as seen in the movie Rustin. One of Rustin's most significant but often unrecognized roles was in organizing the historic 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. As a brilliant strategist and master of nonviolent resistance, Rustin played a crucial behind the scenes role in the success of the march. Yet his sexuality as an openly gay man at a time of intense prejudice led to his contributions being sidelined and his story obscured. Join us as we have a discussion about the complexities of Rustin's life, his pivotal role in the civil rights movement, and the unfortunate erasure of his impact due to societal biases. Rustin is more than just a movie, it's a tribute to a remarkable individual whose legacy continues to inspire and challenge us today. I'm Derek Wise and on behalf of Jay Jones, welcome to Down Home, the Canadian experience from two black men. So, um, yeah, what were your thoughts? Uh, I thought it was a, uh, it's a part of history I didn't know. Um, it's so weird. You know, we do all these podcasts and, and we talk about these things, um, it, things that gone on in history. But then when you actually put a visual to it, it changes it. It changes your perspective just in the sense of it connects you with it more, I guess, because it's a sense that you're really you know, engaged in. And uh, what got me was the imagery of uh, the, I can't remember her name right now. It was Ruby, who the first little kid that got integrated into school. Yeah. When, um, uh, like, it was just such an image. She's skipping along. She's a kid. And then, you know, she's, there's all kinds of people with guns and police and she's in between them and just set this scene. And then, and then other people, when segregation happened, you see, especially in the high school, in the film, you see all these white kids yelling at the black person, ganging up on them, beating mm-hmm. them or, or whatever. And there were even some whites um, that, that stood beside black people for some of these protests and they were under the same guise of as if they were black. So, Mm. I mean, it just transports you back to that time. But with that being said, I really enjoyed it just from the perspective of some of the scenes where there was one, they're outside of some city hall or something. And, uh, and these white people walk by and the the black people, Rustin and some of his crew were there. They're all dressed in suits. And one guy, he's an older gentleman that, that joins them. And he's like, what, you haven't seen a, a proud black man before and it just sort of took me back to that time of even when we grew up like how proud you know our families were regardless of what they went through i can't imagine what it was like in in the states but uh it it was it seemed like a time of pride so that really caught my eye because the civil rights movement was a time when all the black communities got together and tried to stand up for something you know they had broken down the jim crow laws and now they're 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 marching on you know capitol hill a hundred years after the emancipation proclamation that's Mm. pretty that's pretty yeah 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 Yeah, no it was i didn't know anything about the movie or um bayard rust before Mm -hmm. uh before i actually watched the movie so I was kind of coming into a cold. I didn't even know that Coleman Domingo was starring in it. And uh, I really like his work, of course. Yeah. And um, 
in Fear the Walking Dead and some of the mm-hmm. other projects. So I think he's a, a fantastic actor. Yeah, he was in Euphoria as well. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. He he role. was the um, counselor, mentor, mentor, can, yeah. and mentor counselor, the yeah, uh, yeah. ex addict or the yeah. addict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, you're right. Like the the beginning scene, I think it was nine. It it, it comes up and this is 1954, which is when they um they ended school segregation in yeah. most parts of the states yeah but the jim crow laws haven't it didn't no end they, yet. no they yeah. did not but that was just segregate that was yeah. school get school segregation yeah and and uh i made a couple notes and the one thing that i i i noted was yeah it was like white anger mm-hmm. yeah. it was white anger about um these little kids going to the same schools that they're going to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's, that's what, um, that's what I got out of that. And yeah, yeah, you're right. The imagery was, uh, was, was very interesting. Like that one, that one scene that you're talking about of uh, the young girl, um, skipping to school and she's Mm -hmm. surrounded by national guardsmen. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Which, which actually happened. No, it did. Yeah. 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 And, uh, yeah, so it was it was that. Yeah, but the um, uh, the other thing, like like I said, I think uh, Coleman Domingo did a great job. Um, he did. I did like he like embodied the the Bayard's kind of struggle. Yeah, yeah. Because he, you know, he's human, right? Right. And and I um, there was a uh, quote that he said to, I forget who he said it to, but he said, um, oh, when he, when he took a leave of absence from his job after he saw that, um, uh, I think it was Med, Medgar Evers passed away. Oh no, sorry. It wasn't when Med, Med it was uh, a few days after Medgar Evers passed away and the stuff in Birmingham happened. Yes. And so you saw like people being, dragged around dogs being sicked on people yeah. the hoses it, and everything the hoses. Yeah. yeah and um one of his uh co-workers says to him you know uh we we want to when you come into this this uh workspace you have to leave your differences behind right he was saying all this stuff and and he and bayard says to him you know i can't surrender my differences because the world won't let me yeah, I remember that. So yeah, yeah. so yeah. like and that includes include his blackness, mm-hmm. his sexuality, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and his idealisms. The world wouldn't let him do that, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah I, he was raised by his uh, great his great. That's what actually was what caught my eye too. Just him saying, um, you know, he was raised by his grandparents, which happened a lot. Mm. You know, over generations, we were. Yeah. Um, so I connected with that. Bayard Rustin, born on March 17, 1912 in Westchester, Pennsylvania, was a pivotal figure in the American Civil Rights Movement. Raised by his grandparents, Julia and Jennifer Rustin, he was exposed to activism from a young age. In his early years, Rustin's passion for social justice was ignited by his grandmother, Julia, who was a member of the NAACP. Growing up in a Quaker household, he was instilled with values of nonviolence and equality, principles that would shape his activism in the years to come. Rustin attended Wilberforce University, a historic black college in Ohio, but his time there was brief. He was expelled for leading a campus-wide protest against the poor quality of the cafeteria food. He later moved to New York City where he became involved in the vibrant cultural and political scene of Harlem during the 1930s. In these formative years, Rustin began developing his skills as an activist. Influenced by the teachings of Mahatma Gandhi and his commitment to nonviolent resistance, his early activism included organizing protests against racial segregation in public transportation, foreshadowing his later work in the civil rights movement. Um, but he, he also, he, he thought his mother 
was actually his sister for the longest time because yeah. he, he was raised uh his 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 family was actually quite wealthy they were yeah. caterers and uh so he grew up in a big house of 12 12 kids and he was he was basically considered one so mm. for years he thought his uh mother was his sister sister what what really amazed me was the fact that he even though the world wouldn't let him he still did he still was his self. Yeah, man. And uh, there was a quote from his grandmother that I I read. Um, he had discovered that he was he was like, Grandma, I think I like the 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 company of 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 uh, boys. He goes, mm -hmm. I like being around boys. And she just said, Well, I guess you have to do it then. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and I and, and I just thought, Wow, that like his grandmother like really was just. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it also reminded me of a time when black families were a lot closer, I think. Mm. Um, you know, and uh and there was such strength in numbers. That's what I what I really took from it was the community and how it takes a village to get stuff done and um how you know how proud they were and how educated they were and how they stood up against, you know, the system. Yeah. Yeah. There there was a lot of a lot of um th hurdles he had to uh, jump over like mm -hmm. well f first of all our community uh it i'm sure it's changed but a lot of the 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 black people in the states and the the older black populace well actually just the black people in canada in general we're actually quite conservative mm -hmm. sm small c conservative yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, for someone like him to openly be gay, and he was also he was also dating a young white man. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. all that I looked it up, all that stuff is true. Yeah. The the two relationships that they depicted in the in the movie were true. The young white man named Tom mm -hmm. and um Elias, the man, I think. And uh, yeah, Elias black, Taylor black. Yeah. Reverend that he had the affair with. All that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Which just humanizes him if anything right mm -hmm. yeah. um but those were you know he 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 loved who he loved right yeah yeah and well, um, I, I mean he even said that in one of the scene when one of the partners the white partner finds out he said i i have feelings for him mm. so and uh, yeah 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 but um the fact that uh his because he he was the architect the the actual organizer of the march on washington yep and for history to put him aside because of his sexuality it's just it's kind of it's disgusting yeah it totally is one of the main hurdles rustin faced was navigating the complexities of the various civil rights organizations involved from the naacp to the southern christian leadership conference led by dr martin luther king jr Rustin had to coordinate and unify these groups towards a common goal. The movie depicts this well. Despite his organizational and planning skill, Rustin faced immense challenges due to his identity as an openly gay man. At a time when homosexuality was heavily stigmatized, there were concerns within the movement about the potential backlash against Rustin's involvement. And there were political and government leaders like Strom Thurmond and J. Edgar Hoover who attempted to use Rustin's involvement as a means to discredit the march. Despite these obstacles, Rustin persisted, tirelessly working to ensure the success of the march. He was the chief architect of the logistics, coordinating transportation, security, and the overall program for the event. Rustin's influence was felt in every aspect of the march. From its peaceful and organized nature to its emphasis on nonviolent protest. However, despite his crucial role, Rustin's name was absent from the official list of organizers and speakers for the march. In hindsight, the reasons why seemed draconian and backward. The event leaders were concerned about his sexuality, his past ties to left leaning organizations, and they wanted to present a more mainstream image of the civil rights movement to the American public. In the end, while Bayard Rustin's contributions to the 1963 March on Washington were indispensable, he remained largely unrecognized in the official narrative of the event. 
It wasn't until years later that his pivotal role began to receive the recognition that it deserved. As historians and activists shed light on his immense contributions to the fight for civil rights and equality in America. Well, back then, it, homosexuality was considered illegal. Yeah, so, it was yeah. for for most most states. It was actually yeah. illegal. Yeah, which yeah. is um, which is we've come a long way. <laughs> well, know? I mean, you, you would in, think in, so. the, in that regard. I mean, I'm not saying it's still. At least it's not illegal. Yeah, it's you know not illegal, I mean? but <laughs> yes. in the in the court of public opinion, yeah, every like all this stuff still yeah. holds, man. It all it, holds. Well, that that's the thing, and also he was also a big proponent in New York for uh, getting their school system integrated as well. Um, mm -hmm. It was a one day. It was a one day demonstration. It wasn't a march. It was a demonstration, and it had four hundred thousand people, mainly Puerto Ricans and blacks. Who all boycotted and even got some of the teachers to, to to come together and stand inside the union didn't comply but they said they would help anyone who received backlashes and the whole meaning was to integrate the school system and you know he was very passionate about it saying how it would benefit everybody it, a lot of hurdles you know it didn't quite you know it didn't quite stick at first but mm -hmm. uh he he just seemed to be a passionate man and everything that he did he was also an accomplished tenor singer um yeah the, the movie did illustrate of, that yeah. yeah recorded lots of albums and mm -hmm. uh, he went for a trip to africa and learned some negro spirituals and everything like that it was mm -hmm. a pretty interesting dude who i did not know anything about you know because well, it was the, swept aside yeah yeah the his whole history was uh swept aside in, in the fact that he was a, a very good friend of martin luther king luther jr king. Yeah. And um like uh his his kids considered him uncle. Yeah. And the rift that uh you know his his exportation from the NAACP for all those years, the rift that that caused between the two of them, all that stuff is true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I researched it, man, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It is all true. Yeah. And um but, you know, uh they they did come back and work together to put together this the the march on washington mm -hmm. um which you know i didn't the logistics of it i had no idea that it was such yeah. a huge task and the amount of uh resistance that they they faced mm -hmm. from uh like washington city officials yeah like the original march was meant to be a two-day affair yeah um the officials um basically said no one day yeah and they they actually um mobilized every single cop in washington the national guard yeah. and, <laughs> and everything to stand around this yeah. group of uh black people just for the literally the color of their skin yeah and you know? and it was a peaceful protest as was the 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 one in new york as well that mm -hmm. was uh people were just the people were always moved by this that with that one in particular that there was no violence you know what i mean so mm -hmm. well and, that was his credo like I, yeah, I, I don't know if it's true because i didn't research this mm -hmm. but according to he was having a um in one scene he was having a discussion with um uh elias taylor in that the the bar and um he was he he claimed to say when he met martin luther king martin luther king uh when he started to get uh getting noticed by the authorities and, and getting arrested, he had guns in his house. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, Bayard claimed in the movie to be the one to, to uh, help MLK adopt his nonviolent stance. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which really set him apart from uh, other leaders of the time like Malcolm X, right? Yeah, because when Malcolm X first started, they were by any means necessary, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, he was, uh, yeah, he seemed to have that approach of, um, you know, peaceful protesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, it is interesting, though. The other thing that I found interesting was the amount of fundraising that they had to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, uh, the, the uh like black celebrities that were involved in helping yeah. them raise money big time and so, even some of the white celebrities too like some yeah. big ones 
Marlon Brando, Burt Lancaster yeah, yeah. at the time. Um, yeah, it was, I just found it amazing that uh, to see, you know, all those people sort of coming together and uh, just like John Lewis, like uh, uh, also uh, A. Randolph was named. He put the union together, the port, you know, all the yeah. He formed the so it was kind of cool to see how all these people who were like minded going, oh, man, there's there's strength in numbers, obviously. And they did yeah. a lot. They got out there. It was a lot of grassroots stuff like going out there into, you know, into the neighborhoods. And once and they were also very eloquent speakers, which, um, uh, you know, which also helped their cause, you know, to, yeah. to rally passion and and take a look at things differently you know yeah so i i do like the fact that the movie um didn't sugarcoat the amount of um conflict and discord they had within these organizations though yeah that was the like, other thing too that yeah. that i think that was quite realistic like the um even the discord between those who who were like the any means necessary civil rights activists and the nonviolent resistance. There was a part that party scene mm -hmm. to kind of illustrate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which was a big thing. Yeah. Like yeah. there were, there were a lot of civil rights activists. They, they were not in the minority. There was a lot of civil rights activists, especially uh black civil rights activists that believed that a not the nonviolent approach was not the, the right way to go. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah, that's uh, true. And, um, you know, that often backfired because, you know, the FBI and they were all in for violence. So and mm -hmm. then they painted the nar narrative. Oh, well, look, they're trying to cause an uprising. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I actually wanted to ask you that question, actually, when I was sort of uh, researching and watching the movie. Where would you stand like in in that regard as a violence to nonviolent? Oh, like, like, what do you think was more effective? As a young man back then, I probably wouldn't would have been sitting up there in uh, Elijah Muhammad's temple, man. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I when yeah, it, if, yeah. as a young man in my twenties, because you know, mm -hmm. I I um when I was younger, I I had trouble suffering fools, and I I um and if I was in that era, I think I would have I would have been right beside uh, Malcolm X. I don't think mm -hmm. I would have been um, in the the nonviolent camp at that point. Yeah. But as I've gotten older, I can see the benefits of that type of approach, of course, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Because you you definitely, you attract more, more bees with honey than you do with uh, dog poo. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so um, I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? Um, I, I believe in the nonviolent, violent way. Really? I mean, you know, well, back in the, you know, we, I definitely had my scuffles back in the day and, you know, but, uh, I, I think at the heart of who I am, I would probably be, I'd rather talk it out. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. When I fought, I was just being a fool. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's when the temper gets best year, right? So yeah, yeah. you got to find a balance somewhere. And I think that's what, uh, I think that's what he represented. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard to say. I guess now that I'm older now, of course, I think I'm going to go that way. But, uh, you know, I don't know about the spirit of the times. Who knows? Yeah. It, um, and I think it also would have depended where where we were and who we were um, exposed to. Yeah. Also but, that, but yeah, but we also kept to ourselves. Like, you know, we were, we had our circle of friends, but we were always, you know, just, yeah. uh, we did our own thing, I guess. Well, even in the, the sense of like, actually, before we go, uh, before I say what I was about to say, um, you know, Bayard gave me some serious Walter Borden vibes, man. Yeah. Big time. Big. You time. know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, just his manner, like the way that, uh, Coleman Domingo played him, his energy mm -hmm. was very much like uh like a Walter Borden, very theatrical. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't know if I've never seen any video of uh of Rustin. Um yeah. but um but the way that uh Coleman Domingo played him definitely was like a like a Walter Borden esque type of yeah, uh, yeah. thing. And e even like I, I you know, you can even say Walter Borden is is our version 
the Bayard of, uh, Rustin. Bayard yeah. Rustin. Yeah, I, uh, I can totally see that. Because he was in the background. Like, if if you if you want to look at it like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Where Rocky Jones was in the f- forefront. Yeah. In hell, in the in Nova Scotia, in Halifax, yeah, so, right? totally. Yeah, yeah, and Walter Walter Borden had a huge presence. You know, mm-hmm. so I I even remember him in you know growing up in the church and stuff. You could always he was always around. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, yeah, yeah. But no, you're totally right. That's totally yeah. Walter Borden vibes. There was a lot of presence in Domingo's performance as well, which yeah. you know, uh, Walter Borden. You 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 know he speaks and you're just like boom. It's like yeah. reminds me of James Earl Jones, like you know that mm. definitive kind of presence. Yeah, yeah, That's, definitely. Uh, yeah. Well, what I was gonna say is, um, like, like not like taking ourselves, like our our young selves, our twenty twenty year old selves, and putting us into the the sixties era in Halifax because there was a lot of this civil rights activism going on in Halifax in the mid to late sixties, especially when it centered around uh, the wrongs that were going on in, in uh, Africville, Mm -hmm. the amount of protests and, and uh, you know, uh, that were going on for that, you know, I, I think I would have been there in a, in a, in, in that, uh, that sense, I think I would have been going to the protests and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. I think uh, it's a very good point. I think if, if I was, you know, back then, and I think in that time, my family was actually still living in the North end. So I would have been exposed to a, a different environment that I actually grew up in. And I, and I, I grew up in that environment as well. Cause I went to church every Sunday, hmm. but um, you know, I, uh, I think I think my temperament probably would have been a bit different if I lived amongst it all the time instead of growing up in a mostly white neighborhood like I I did, yeah. you know. So yeah, yeah. But you know, um, yeah, it still existed though. I still I remember you just being young and witnessing racism, you know. So mm. um, and it, when I was young, I the only. I hated it. Like I I remember it having a profound effect on me. And the only way I was able to, to sort of uh, get it away was I became sort of like the funny dude. Right. I mean, everyone liked me. So, um, but I don't know if I would have had that attitude if I had the strength in numbers, you know, it was when I was engaged in the black community, especially in my twenties. Oh Lord. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, any final thoughts on uh, the movie? Uh, I just thought the movie was well depicted. It was good to see some, uh, a lot of good black actors in there. Uh, Jeffrey Wright. There was even a female at the beginning. I I don't know her name, but she was the older woman. Um, she came in with the thing, uh, the the headdress over over her, like uh, what the handkerchief. Yeah. And she was an older woman. She's actually Canadian. So oh, okay. um, she's a well-known Canadian actress, like a sort of like a character actor. So mm-hmm. that was that was also cool to see. And it was just also good to see that a black story got told. And, uh, you know, and according to your research, not of a lot of it was embellished, like, you know, no. all Hollywood can be. So and I appreciate the fact that these these stories are being told and i learned something i did not know about and uh and um yeah and it just shows a lot of a lot of uh pride in um what the blacks did to try to overcome Mm -hmm. um yeah i i thought it was um i again i didn't know it was a biopic yeah i didn't know if it was part biopic part documentary Mm-hmm. which I thought it was going to be, but you know, yeah. I, I, I don't mind, uh, like a, uh, like a kind of like a dramatized biopic. That's, that's fine. Yeah. It, I think it was done tastefully. Yeah. yeah. So that's good. But it was produced by the Obamas. Oh, wow. Yeah. So well, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. So they, they're, I think that was part of their Netflix deal mm-hmm. that they, that yeah. they signed. Right. So yeah. Good on them. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, see what else they got coming. <laughs> yeah, I think I think they I think they do yeah have more in the yeah more in the queue so yeah yeah cool breaking new crab breaking new crab breaking new crab 
You have been listening to Down Home. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. On a high plateau, from the one down below to the future of the funk, getting lost in the flow. Contact with the spot, McX. Now it's time to flex with the force from the soul, reaching all aspects, getting deep. No time to sleep as you reach your next phase, laying it all on the line. New trail start to blaze, it's a fire inside. A brand new path, breaking down the sum to one, feeling free. I just laugh with the joy. The song, breaking new ground. From the breakdown, the vibe like magic prescribed. Only to see the perfect blend like a diamond in the rough. Ready to drop a perfect gem. It's time to shine so fine to see what you find.